Uh, let me introduce Clayton. Can we give him a proper like renewal welcome as he comes up? Okay, this side did much better. Like, Hezborn, are you asleep? Seriously? <laughs> come, 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 mate. Let me pray for you. So, Clayton is here from uh, our kind of parent church in the UK, Holy Trinity Brompton, um, which is in the fancy part of London. But he's doing some amazing stuff. I'm looking forward to hearing more about. They've become known as the Refugee Church in the middle of London, welcoming people from uh, far and wide and doing some incredible stuff. And he's out here for a couple of weeks hanging out with us. You must have nothing better to do. So that's, that's good of you to be here. But let me just pray for you. Lord God, I thank you for uh, Clayton being with us. I thank you for his heart for you. And I pray you just use him today to uh, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So just in case you're wondering, uh, this is how God works. We're, I'm at a, a Christian event in the UK uh, a year ago. And so we go with some of the team from here and we'd put up a massive Kenya flag and just had it hoisted above the, the camper van we were staying in. And we're like, God, if you have anyone you'd like us to meet, uh, let them see this Kenya flag and, and come and talk to us. And then the next morning, Clayton pops his head around and goes, um, do you guys have anything to do with Kenya? And we're like, no, 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 we just put the flag up for fun. <laughs> so that is, how, that is how we met and here, we, here you are with us. Here I am. Thank you, Chris. Don't let the oh, sorry, don't let the Church of England um, fool you. I was born and raised Pentecostal, so for a minute, can we be Pentecostal just for a minute? Yeah. Uh, yes, I have my Pentecostal brothers and sisters. So turn to someone next to you. Just find someone next to you. Find someone next to you and tell them, neighbor. It, it has to come from the stomach, like neighbor. <laughs> Tell them, for God so loved you that he gave his only son that if you believe in him, you will not perish but live eternally. Clap for your neighbor, not you. Clap for your neighbor. That's good. That's good. <laughs> right. Uh, so as Chris said, my name is Clay and uh, I'm a national fan. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> I, oh yeah, I think I'm making more friends than uh, than enemies. And uh, apart from being a national fan, I love telling stories. And my favorite story to tell is the story of Jesus Christ. And so today I want to spend some time to tell you a story uh, that Jesus tells about money. And maybe you're here and saying, "Okay, yeah, pastors and money, another money, someone, you know." Um, don't worry, we'll we'll. We will iron it out in a, in a bit. But before we get into it, I want you to find your neighbor again. Your neighbor again. You're going to find your neighbor many times today. And I, I want you to ask him this, him or her this question. All right? Ask your neighbor this question. Ask your neighbor this question. If you had uh, two job offers, one that uh, you really like, you're really good at, you're passionate at, and they're paying you 10,000 shillings, and one that you don't enjoy, it's paying uh, you uh, a million shillings. Which one would you choose? No, no, talk to your neighbor. Talk to your neighbor and tell them. <laughs> right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. We see you all, all of you who are like fake humble people and are saying 10,000, we see you. And we see you materialistic people, one million, all of you. Um, if we're being honest, money and property is quite important in our, our society. So I think it's quite important for us to actually talk about money and uh, property and how we can relate with uh, this too. I was born and raised in a small, tiny village in Kajiado called Ololoi Tikoshi. Now, Ololoi Tikoshi means zebra crossing, and it's not figurative because literally, we had literal zebras, antelopes, you know, hyenas just passing through our village, just casually saying hello, and they would, they would cross the corridor. Um, it's, a small, it's a small village, and my dad was a pastor in a very tiny church. So it's a humble beginning, and so on special occasions, we'd have chapati, right? And if you're lucky enough, you'll have chapati and chicken. 
And on these days, we'd say, Maisha London. Maisha? How many of you know that term, Maisha London? Yeah. If you don't know this term, you, you're not uh, part of those people. Jesus says, happy are those. You know, <laughs> happy are the, the poor. Yeah, Maisha London means life in London. And basically, life in London, for us, was like the epitome of life. Like, you've made it. Like the fulfillment of life. So I vowed, I swore to myself when I was a kid that I want to do two things in life. One, um, I want to make tons of money. That's one. And two, I want to uh, go and live uh, in London. And so far, I managed to do one. I live in London. So the money part is still a story that I say, Maisha London. But over time, actually, I realized Maisha London means more than just money. Every time I interact with Jesus, I'm like, do you know what? Like, actually, fulfillment comes from something that is more than money, more than property. And this evening, I wonder, what does Maisha London mean for you? When you hear, like, fulfillment, what gives you that note where you'd say, I have made it. I'm at the epitome of life. Is it the one million, money? Is it a good job? Or perhaps a romantic relationship? And maybe you're in college and you, you, you're asking me, Clay, what money? What money are you talking about? You know, or maybe you feel like, you know, I have a good job and, and for me that is my epitome of uh, life. But Jesus wants to introduce to us something that is radically different. Uh, he wants to tell us a story that changes things uh, the way we see money and property. I wonder for you, what extent would you go to leave Maisha London? In our passage today, Jesus gives us a glimpse of what it means to live a fulfilling life. And Jesus wants to tell us that money and material things are not bad, but they're just a means and not the end. So turn with me to the book of Matthew, and we're going to read uh, just a small passage from verse, uh, chapter 6, verse uh, 16, verse 16 to 24. I'll read from the NIV version and it says, Do not store up yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy. And where thieves uh, break into steel. But store up yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where the thieves do not break into steel. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is, a la- is, 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 is the lamp of the body. Uh, if, you, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your body will be full of darkness. If, uh, if then... The light within you is darkness. How great is that darkness? 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Lord, thank you for this evening. I pray that you remind us um, the things you want us to remember. Amen. This passage is part of uh, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And basically, the Sermon on the Mount is teachings that Jesus gives to paint a picture of what it would look like if we lived out the gospel. It's a a sermon that uh, Jesus is giving and saying, this is the ideal life that would be if we lived out practically the gospel. And now we are the part of money and possessions. And to give you context, uh, Jesus is talking to the uh, Israelites. And at this time, it's like 4,000, 5,000, thousands of people are listening to Jesus. And at this time, uh, Israel is under the Roman rule. So they are paying taxes, heavy taxes. Actually, it was so bad that uh, you would pay taxes on the spot. Can you imagine like just you walking on the road and and the government comes to you guys from, uh, what's it called? The tax body? KRA. KRA, guys just find you on the road. They're like, yo, you owe us uh, 10,000 on the spot and you have to pay now. And the problem was you could pay, like when you pay over here and by But like you meet another one at the gate, they would uh, make you pay double. They were so brutal. And they were living at a place where they need to pay rent, a high level of living and all this. Then Jesus comes and says, you know what, guys? I don't want you to hustle and uh, focus on money. I just want you to store your knees in heaven. And I wonder if that um, makes you relate to a city. I think we live in a time where times are hard. You know, taxes, Manda Mando Mondays, and all these things that are happening around. It's, it's difficult for many of us, right? Can you imagine me coming and you actually literally focusing to work so hard to gain all this money, buy all these properties, to save a lot of things, and, you know, spend and invest. And I'm like, 
Bro, sis, like, just, I want you to drop everything you're doing. Actually, I want you to focus on in heaven. That is the context in which we walk into, and, and they're probably confused, and they're wondering, why would Jesus want us to drop everything that we're doing and focus on heaven? Jesus wants to introduce two things. So I have good news, and I have bad news. Which one should I start with? Bad news, good. You're good students. I'll start with bad news. The bad news is money can cause us to be greedy and blind our, uh, our spiritual lives. Money can cause us to be greedy and blind our spiritual lives. In this passage, Jesus starts very well speaking about money, right? So he goes like, no one, uh, he, he talks about like, do not store up your treasures. Then he goes like, you know, he talks about money. And then verse, uh, somewhere around verse 22, he decides to say that the eye is the lamb of the body. Then he continues, no one can serve two masters, hey, serve money or God. And you're like, you are talking about money all of a sudden telling us about eyes and lamps. Like, why would you insert that thing in, in there? What does it really actually mean to be there? This is a very interesting part of this passage. And he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Think about, the, about it this way. There is light in this room. And because of that, the eye picks the light. And therefore, we are able to walk. And if there was no light, we would be stumbling and falling and doing other different things. In fact, Jesus uses the same, same um, illustration in, I think it's Luke, Luke 11, 34. And he talks about the eye is the lamp of the body. That is, if your eye is dark, your whole body is dark. Then after talking about the eye and the lamp, he goes to chapter 12 of the same Luke, chapter 12, verse 15. He says, watch out, be on your guard against all, uh, all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. So basically, Jesus is, is uh, uh, associating the eye and greediness because greed has a way of hiding itself under positive things. So for example, if you're greedy, you might say, I'm ambitious. You know, I'm hardworking. But wh wh where is that really coming from? Where is that coming from? Uh, there are seven, to give you context, there are seven deadly sins in the Bible, right? So we would say, you know, like uh, adultery, pride, all these things. And Jesus says, he just says, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. The only thing that Jesus says, be, watch out, you might be committing, you, watch out um, for greed. Because if you're committing something like adultery, for example, you won't be doing it. And then you'll be like, oops, watch, oh, no, wait, are you, you're not my wife. You know what I mean? You know when you're committing adultery, but when you're greedy, chances are many of us here are living in greed, especially with money, and we don't know because we relate greed of money with the, you know, the rich MP who's been stealing on the road and doing all those things, and you know, we don't see that as me, Clay, who is actually being greedy. So Jesus is saying that materialism and dependence on money and material things has a peculiar way of uh, blinding you spiritually or distorting the way you see things because you focus on the material uh, rather than the things around, around you. It has the power over the way you see things. Materialism has the power to uh, get you to choose a job that you actually don't like or even know how to do, but because there's a lot of money, even if it's like a bit corrupt, as long as my department is not the corrupt one, you know what I mean? I, I, I can take this job. Materialism has a way of joining companies that, you know, actually destroy communities around us. We're like, me, I don't do anything. I just drive to work. I earn my money. I go to see the company that does that. It's because you're blinded. They pay me well. So I'm going to be able to just continue doing it. So that's the bad news. The bad news that Jesus is making the point that greed and power leads us to spiritual blindness. Now, on to the good news. We're done with the bad news. The good news is this. The gospel can break the power of greed. The gospel can break the power of greed. Verse 19, it says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and uh, rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in to steal. He says, don't treasure earthly treasures, but treasure heavenly treasures. Everyone of us has something they treasure really much. 
what does it mean to treasure something? This is the definition of treasuring something. It means to look, to look at something, to fill your heart with the beauty and the value of it, and to treasure something uh, as, as if to say, if I, ha- if I have this, I have everything. If I have this, I have Maisha London. If only I can get that, you know, whatever that means for you, I have everything. But whatever that is, you are enslaved to it. Once your soul treasures something, you will pay any price for it. You will do anything just to get it because it's the only thing that's worth it. And you might think, like, Jesus, what, what gives you the authority to actually advise us? You know, like, you know, like the biggest financial advisor in Israel at the moment, you like a guy who walks around with 50 losers and, you know, whatever. But Jesus is going something like, you know what? I know what it means to treasure something. I know what it means to treasure something so much that I give everything for it. And this is, this is, this is how he knows. I'll tell you a story to illustrate this. Uh, in 1931, there was a prince called Prince Edward. Uh, so Prince Edward went to, sailed to America. And when he got to America, he fell in love with this lady, American lady called Wallis Simpson. Uh, but unfortunately, he, Wallis Simpson was married to a man. So they couldn't get married. Um, but being the patient man, uh, he comes back to, uh, to the UK. He waits and waits and waits. So Wallis is divorced. He goes back, and then Wallis marries another guy. He's like, okay, fine, I'm going to wait. And then Prince, Prince Edward became the king of England. And by that time, Wallis divorced again, and now she was available. And he was like, okay, fine, I'm going to marry you either way. But the Church of England said, do you know what? We can't let a king marry a divorcee, not just once, but twice. And guess what the king did? He said, you know what? I'm going to abdicate the kinghood and I'm going to be a commoner so I can marry my love. And that's the story of Jesus. He looks at us and he is like, you know what? I am in heaven and you are the divorcees and all of you are down here and I'm going to give up everything because I treasure you and I'm going to come and make you my bride. Jesus knows what it means to treasure that he can give up everything, including his life, to come after you. So, here are two truths from what I've just told you today. The truth is, we are more materialistic than we can even agree or imagine. The truth is, you and I are more greedy than we can admit, think, or imagine. Yet the good news is that we are so loved that the creator of heaven and earth, that he wants to change our hearts and our priorities to align with heavenly treasures. And for this uh, heart to change, there needs to be a shift. There needs to be a shift in our culture. Here's what our culture says. If you live in Nairobi, this is what our culture says. Our culture says, you need to work so hard that you buy Bentleys. Jesus comes and says, you need to work so hard and pray on your knees. On the other side, our culture says, you know what? You need to point a finger when someone does something wrong. Jesus says, you need to extend a hand when someone does something wrong. Our culture says, the more you earn, the better. Jesus says, the more you give, the better. There has to be a shift in what we are doing. And the gospel, which is Jesus Christ, starts with the fact that we are corrupted. Our hearts are corrupted. We have greed. We have selfishness. Then it moves to Jesus dying on the cross and Telester die. It is finished. The greed, you know, the bad news, the bad choices, whatever it is, it is finished. But that's not where the, 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 the gospel ends. Because Jesus did not just live and die. He died, then he lived. And this time, forever, Then when he ascended to heaven, he goes and sends the Holy Spirit who inspires us and reminds us to make the right choices with with our money, to spend in the right places, to achieve in the right way. And perhaps you're thinking, well, uh, you don't know how hard it is in Nairobi. (laughs) You know, you probably live in London and just like Maisha London. Got ground between different, by the way. Um, uh, where, Where are as the Bible says, where our heart is, where our treasure is, there our hearts will be. So I want to ask you again today, where 
is your heart. And as we finish, I'm going to pray for us and thinking about the change of culture and how we can uh, think about just this shift of knowing, if you forget everything I've said today, the shift of knowing that money can actually blind me spiritually. But if I am blinded with money spiritually, the gospel and Jesus is able to cure my greed and uh, you know, f- fault spiritually. I want to finish with a piece of prayer that if you f- reflect along that, we'll have a few, t- a few moments to just um, read a few questions and perhaps you might be able to think, I maybe relate with what that guy has said, or maybe I don't, and in the, in the same way I don't, it makes me remind me where I am in my stage of life because I don't know how you walked into this church today feeling. You probably felt like, you know, I am happy today, like, you know, uh, everything is going well. Or you probably felt like, I'm probably a bit down. I just want some encouragement. And I want the last word for you to hear is the good news, which is, I am so loved. However it is, whatever I have done, whatever choices I have made with my money, or whatever thoughts I have had, my actions, my thoughts, my words, have been cured on the cross of Jesus Christ. So if you could just get in a posture of prayer, however you prefer it, stretch your hands, close your eyes, uh, or just listen and stare in the sky or look at me. I would want to pray this prayer over you, and it says, Lord, you've asked my whole life in heaven, uh, you've asked me to place my whole life in heavenly treasures. Would you give me the strength to fight the world's pressure? And when I face temptations, I will trust you. I will trust you when I'm tired and weary. I will call upon you when the world keeps calling me. I will extend my hand when I'm tempted to point a finger. I will trust you. I will wait like dawn awaits for the sun rays, like the desert patiently awaits for the rain. I will find your joy when I'm in pain. I will trust you when things don't go my way. By your feet I will lay. I will trust you. In my deepest sorrows, when my future seems blurry and I cannot see any income for tomorrow, I will seek for your, right, uh, for your light like a moth seeks for light. I will trust you in my darkest night. I will trust you in my biggest hustles. I will st- trust you in my biggest uh, uh, investments because I know that your will for me is right. In your will, I will rest engulfed by your peace and grace. Like a dove comes home to her nest, in your love I will rest. I will trust you with my treasure. Lord, thank you for um, where we are. And I pray as we just think about a few questions and discuss them, Lord, that you will remind us the places we need to pay attention to, the areas of life that you need us to rethink, things that we thought are the fulfilling things for us, things that are the epitome of life for us, that are material, that we will see them as a means and not an end, that we will use those resources to bless your kingdom. And I pray, Lord, our prayer, just just acknowledging that not every one of us has the material or the money or even the will, I pray a prayer of provision because you, Holy Lord, does provide. You are the owner of everything, the maker of heaven and earth. And I pray, Lord, that you reveal yourself by moving things in the ways of our our prayers that will say, he has done it again. In Jesus' name, amen.